Yeah, should we do that? Yeah, we could do that. Two, and the feather goes to the other side. Three, four, and the first side again. Five, six, and you're going to fold your arm in like a wing on a swan, and you're going to reach forward, sweeping the curtains to the side and sweeping the curtains to the other side and reaching up, drawing both hands together and then down to the center as you take a bow. Imagining that you have a bellows between your hands, you're gonna open slightly and take air in and drop and a little bit bigger and drop and a little bit bigger and drop and bigger still and let your hands extend all the way up, let your focus rise as high as possible to the diagonal, dropping in, dropping into your shoulder dropping your head and neck down, taking off a beautiful sweater and throwing it out to the sides as you bring your hands down. And we'll repeat the whole thing to the other side. We're going to try it with music in one moment. Just think about those images again. The feather aloft, the swan wing coming in, the curtains opening, and the bellows increasing gradually in size. All right, so we're going to keep all those images going as we go forward. Let's try this with music. Thank you, William. Flying up one. And think of opening your gills or your ribs. Dropping down. Forward reach and out. And reach. Let your focus Ready? go with your hands up. Beautiful bow forward. Your bellows are opening a little bit with the breath. A little bigger, bigger still. And this one carries you all the way up to the diagonal. As far as is comfortable, reach. And reach, and there's a little lean there as well. Drop, elbows, hands press. Let's try it again to the other side, reach. Let this really suspend. <gasps> suspend up. Glide across, reaching forward, send your energy past the walls of your house. So you're trying to see out, side, reaching up, and drop. A little bit of air first, and expanding, and let your focus expand as well with your hands, open. And the biggest one yet, and reach. Nice and smooth in your arms. Dropping and releasing, taking off that sweater, opening your hands, and a deep breath in. Very well done. Excellent. All right, I want to try that one more time. Same thing. I'm not going to narrate this time, but try to keep all of those images, the feather, the swan, the curtains, the bellows, in your body as we do this phrase together. All right. William, we're going to go one more time. Thank you.
Dancers use images all the time to help them move. And one of the ways we do that is to put ourselves in a scene and imagine that we are creating a series of effects. So for this combination, we're going to imagine that we're outside and there are going to be a series of visual natural effects that happen that we're going to try to manifest in our bodies. So the first thing we're going to do is clear the fog in front of us. So you can imagine there's this curtain of fog and you brush your hand out and clear the fog. Now you can see. So you're going to look out as far as you can under your hand, and really imagine that you're seeing a beautiful vista away from you. Now that you've cleared the fog and are able to see, you're going to see a beautiful sunrise that comes up through the center, and I'm going to try to keep my fingertips together. And that sun is going to set on the other side, and then because it's nighttime, the stars are going to come out. So I have two little flashes of light that I'm creating by opening my hands like this. And I'm going to do the whole thing to the other side. So I'm sweeping the fog away, I'm looking around, trying to see into the distance. The sun starts low on the horizon, comes up through the apex, and back down to the other side. And then I have two stars coming out. Now, as we go along, you can increase the number of stars rhythmically to be four instead of two, just as a representation of the thousands of stars, millions of stars that are out there. So that's the first part. The second part, we're going to place ourselves next to a beautiful river. So we're going to create that river with our hands and fingers. So a very soft, flowing action here. And then a flock of birds is going to fly over that river, very softly and gently, but a different quality in our fingers, right? So this is undulating and watery. And this is wing-like as we go. A giant moon is going to shine. And really see the light of that moon as you create it up above, and then a light mist is going to fall down through the center. So that second part starts with the water, the birds, creating a giant moon up over your head, and you can let your focus go up as well, and a light mist falling down. We're going to try that with some music, and I'm going to talk you through it as we go. We'll do both parts. Reaching around, clearing the fog, and peering out into the distance. Sun rises up, keep it moving, sunset, flash star, and star. Same thing to the other side. And look. Sun rises up, fingertips together, and keep your shoulders relaxed here as well. Star, star. Let's do the second part. So the water, soft and gentle. Flock of birds. Giant moon up. And a light mist falls. Go to the other side. So water, very soft with your fingers. The birds are just skimming over the water. Very active in your fingers. Giant moon goes up. And a light mist falls. We go from the beginning, reaching around. And peering out. Really let your focus go farther than your own room. And reaching up and over. And now four stars. One, two, three, four. The second part. Soft water and fly. Reaching up a giant moon, really see the color of that moon above your head. And the light mist is going to fall, and we're going to reverse the whole thing like playing the tape backwards. So lifting up through the center, and opening as wide as you can, that moon falls away. The birds fly home. And the water retreats, soft, 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 soft. Four stars, one. Two, three, four, the sun rises and sets. And you look again and reaching away.
can't see myself. I can't see myself. All right, we're going to get our feet going with a little tango inflected dance. Uh, this is not a tango, but there. Are we all? Uh, Hi, we... Dr. Rizak, Dr. Plon, Alan. Uh, are we all set? On... Is our audience ready? We, yep. yeah. So, so. Dr. Phil, you are ready to rock and roll here. I think okay. we're ready to start, okay? Okay, so everybody who is joining us uh, from all over the place, I hope nobody was stuck in traffic. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn. And uh, first of all, a special thank you to the person whose passion and uh, mission and drive and hard work make this all happen, and that's our dear friend, Susan Lust without whom we wouldn't have any of this. So Susan, amazing, thank you. Uh, our founder and director of Parkinson's Wellness Project, PWP. So first a word about the Parkinson's Wellness Project. It is a nonprofit organization to promote, designed to promote awareness and education while promoting wellness strategies and social interaction for people with Parkinson's disease. The organization is a bridge between the Parkinson's community and the world at large hoping to break barriers of isolation and helplessness associated with Parkinson's disease. Uh, please, please feel free to check out our website, parkinsonswellnessproject.org for upcoming events. And we also want to now a word of appreciation for three of our sponsors, three wonderful companies without whose support we couldn't do all these things. And those three companies are USA World Meds, represented today by Bill Fitzsimmons and Allison Miller, Adamus, represented here by Joe Snyder and Mary Ann Gromish, Acadia, represented by Neon Oladipo, Oladipo and Francesco Roth. Uh, I'm gonna share a word about each of our sponsors and uh, then we will get rocking. Uh, US World Meds, their comment is that they hold a fundamental belief that our science has the potential to improve the lives of people with Parkinson's disease. Our commitment to people with Parkinson's and to their care partners is reflected in everything we do. Our pipeline of development projects, along with our three currently available Parkinson's treatments, reflect our resolve to bring innovative solutions to the Parkinson's community. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about their therapies, uh, please visit opokin.com, A-P-O-K-Y-N.com, myoblock.com, M-Y-O-B-L-O-C, and exadago, X-A-D-A-G-O.com. Adamus, at Adamus, our purpose and vision are to deliver innovative medicines to make a difference for people with Parkinson's, their caregivers, and society at large. Adamus is a fully integrated company focusing on growing a portfolio of therapies that address a range of neurologic diseases. In 2018, Adamus successfully launched Gokovri, amantadine, an extended release capsule, the first and only FDA approved medicine for the treatment of dyskinesia in people with Parkinson's who are receiving levodopa based therapy. Gokovri is the only medicine clinically proven to reduce both dyskinesia and off time. And for information about that, please visit their website, adamaspharma.com. Recently, Adamus conducted the Adamus on the Move Challenge, and their employees raised $15,000 for the Parkinson's Foundation. Acadia Pharmaceuticals is passionate about improving the lives of people with central, ner central nervous system disorders. They're becoming a leading biopharmacological company dedicated to developing and commercializing innovative therapies in the central nervous system. During COVID-19, Acadia is, uh, in the interest of public health, 
has its employees working from home while continuing to advance clinical research. Acadia partners with advocacy groups to support patients' understanding of telehealth and how to maximize a virtual doctor's visit, a good thing. Acadia supports webinars focused on PD and mental health and has developed a tips and tools resource for care partners. Acadia is committed to the Parkinson's community and is pleased to be support supporting this event here today. Uh, Acadia is not responsible for the content that is presented by those of us who are present here. So thank you to all of those and let's dive into our lunch and learn. Uh, our first special guest I'm privileged to introduce is a special man who has spent decades of dedicating his life and experiencing what it's like to try and help people with Parkinson's disease. Dr. Michael Rizak is a board certified neurologist practicing at the Nuvance Health System. He is the director of Movement Disorders Center and the co-director of the Movement Disorders Neurosurgical Program at the Vassar Brothers Medical Center and Hospital in Poughkeepsie, New York. In addition to his medical degree, Dr. Rizak holds degrees in psychology, neuroanatomy, and bioethics. Dr. Rizak has extensive experience in deep brain stimulation. So, Dr. Rizak, what's on your mind? You're muted. Oh, we need to change the mic, turn the mic on. There we go. I'm honored to be here today. I've got a lot on my mind and uh, a lot to talk about. And what I'd like to do now is just give you an overview of the area that we're going to be talking about today. And that is an area that involves thinking, uh, memory, and our emotions, anxiety and depression, uh, and even apathy. And these can all be symptoms and signs that accompany Parkinson's disease. And we, uh, Dr. Pallone, who's joining me a little later, and I deal with this uh, almost on a daily basis. These are the non-motor features of some of them. As we mentioned before, sleep is a non-motor feature. Constipation is a non-motor feature. These are features that are associated with Parkinson's disease. And they're not uh, altogether uncommon. We just have to be able to recognize them. And Patients have to be able to tell us what's going on. Families, patients, uh, communication with the doctor is critical. And if we don't hear about what's going on at home, uh, we may not know because patients can put on a good show when they come to see us in the office and they look really good. But at home, they will not get off the couch. They're depressed. Um, they spend time ruminating about things. They may even have obsessive compulsive problems. These are all part and parcel of Parkinson's disease. They're not separate. Uh, they are non-motor, but they're just as troubling and they can be disabling to a, a great degree for many, many patients. The other thing I wanna say is that not everybody has these, just like constipation or other sleep problems. It's important to know that this is really educational right now to understand that this is a, Parkinson's is a spectrum of illness and some people will never have what I'm gonna be talking about today, and others, it may be an issue. The good news is there are treatments. If the doctor knows what's going on or the treater will say that, we can do something about it. Um, there are many treatments and we need to know about them to be able to help uh, patients. Um, again, discuss with your doctor. Uh, don't uh, pull away, become reclusive and not want to talk about it. And if there are loved ones who see this happening, please let us know, the doctors can act. Um, the other thing to know is if there is a, one of these affective or mood problems or thinking problems, it can be caused by something other than Parkinson's disease. We need to know that we've ruled out other issues like thyroid. If you're hypothyroid, People get very slow and they thinking isn't good and they may get depressed. Um, sometimes uh, B12 levels can be low. B12 is uh, the neurology vitamin. It's a, we call it the great imitator. And if it's low, it can uh, mimic many other illnesses, including uh, memory problems and mood problems. So we, we 
always check those. And there are certain things that have to be evaluated before we absolutely say this is Parkinson's related. And so every doctor, know, most doctors that treat movement disorders and Parkinson's know that this needs to be done. Furthermore, we have other diagnostic techniques to tell us exactly what's wrong. Formal neuropsychological testing. There are neuropsychologists available that can do some testing and actually tell us objectively what is going on. What is the diagnosis? What is this most likely uh, related to? And that will help guide us to offer patients uh, a treatment. With regard to depression, sometimes it's a we call it a reactive depression. And that is, well, nobody likes to get a diagnosis of anything wrong with them. And we feel badly about it. And it can bring us down and make us sad. But more often than not, in Parkinson's, it is an endogenous depression, which means it's related to some chemical imbalance, which we can treat and make much better. I'll give you an example. I had a patient that, uh, I won't, I'll say uh, Mrs. Schwartz, that's generic, uh, that came in and her husband was very concerned because she was not thinking right. She, she, he was concerned that she had a dementia and we evaluated her and I looked at some things and I felt I kind of had a handle on it, but I had the neuropsychologist do an evaluation. I checked all the blood tests and things and everything was normal. And it turned out to be what we call a pseudo dementia, which was related to what she was very depressed. And once we treated the depression, things lightened up, thinking got better. So these things may not be irreversible. They, they can be treated and we need to be on top of it and look at all the details. Um, and I know uh, Dr. Pallone and I have been partners for a long time in movement disorders and uh, she has a very similar approach uh, to uh, this area. So today we're going to be talking about, um, and I should mention one more thing, and that is perceptions. Sometimes when we have some cognitive problems or some other issues, that we have, then, you know, it may alter our uh, perceptions of the world. Our visual spatial uh, relationships may not be presented normally to us. And so those are things, again, that can be treated, worked on through occupational therapy, speech therapy, uh, special uh, exercises, uh, and repeated uh, activities that will push you to use all of the faculties that one has where things can be improved. Um, a lot of data has been shown that the people who read, try to remember things, stay current, have a bigger database, tend to have a much better prognosis when it comes to any of the memory problems or emotional problems that sometimes come along with Parkinson's disease. So um, I'm going to ask Dr. Pallone if she has anything else to add. I, I'm sure I forgot something, but um, uh, Jennifer? Well, I, I look forward to talking with everyone later and answering some of the questions. And I think we'll be touching base on what everyone is concerned about with their memory and their mind. And I look forward to answering those questions. And certainly that'll reiterate everything that Dr. Rizak just brought up. So we'll talk some more later. All right. Thank you, Phil. Hear me, yeah, sorry about that. Got to get used to the button pushing. Uh, I, I do lose my voice often, and um, but that was me mechanical. Uh, we are going to have an opportunity with Dr. Pallone and Dr. Rizak to ask some Q&A. We've collected some questions. We're going to come back to that in a little while. So that was a good starter. And I think you've touched on many of the items that are in the questions. So uh, we'll be coming back for more of that in a few minutes. Now I'd like to introduce a very special guest who's with us, uh, it's someone who I've heard a lot about and just got to meet in preparation for this meeting. So it's a delight to introduce David Leventhal. Um, and David started an organization called Dance for PD. Uh, David is the founding, the founder and the director of Dance for PD. He leads dance classes for people with Parkinson's disease and he also trains other 
dance professionals to do the same all over the world. Did you listen carefully so you could do this with Daisy? Uh, and uh, the program is based on a principle that professionally trained dancers are in fact movement experts. They have incredible knowledge about balance and sequencing and rhythm, rhythm and aesthetic awareness and in fact expressing oneself through movement. And so they're very ideally suited to help people with Parkinson's disease enhance these abilities in themselves. Uh, David, uh, why don't you take it away and tell us a little bit about how you got involved in this and I've got tons of questions for you as well. <laughs> Great, well, first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to to join you today in this beautiful Sunday. Um, it's really an honor to be able to share the platform with such esteemed medical professionals and uh, with all of you at home who are, who are joining in. Um, I just wanna take a, a moment. I am, I am outside here because it is such a lovely day. And I just wanna recognize uh, that we are on land that was originally inhabited by the Kichuan and Wapander people. Um, many hundreds of years ago, they inhabited this land just uh, east of the Hudson River, and we uh, honor them and their ancestors and acknowledge that they are the original owners of this land that we are now on. Um, I am hearing a bit of background. I just want to make sure that um, our hosts have a chance to mute the um, everybody at home so we, we have a chance to focus on the, on the voices. All right. Great. Uh, Phil, you know, we, we started this program really at the invitation of our community. And one woman in particular, who is a visionary, uh, leader of a Parkinson support group in Brooklyn, who heard a lot from her participants, how much time they spent thinking about, talking about, and worrying about Parkinson's disease. And she understood that one of the one of the benefits of a support group is to share challenges, but she wanted more for her group. She wanted a, an opportunity for people to come together and to change their stories, to change their stories from a trajectory of being permanent patients, medicalized and seen as such, to a place where they felt they could be themselves again, um, where they had a voice, where they had a chance to express themselves, where they had a chance to break out of some of the isolation that happens in Parkinson's and to be together and to have a sense of belonging as a community. And this woman's name was Oli Westheimer and her vision was that dance would be that thing that would bring people together in a meaningful, expressive and creative way that was not about Parkinson's. Right? So when people come into a dance class, they are viewed in our program as dancers, as artists, as creative people. Uh, we don't see them as patients. We don't see anyone as having a problem. That said, we are very aware of many of the issues, motor and non-motor, that people with Parkinson's are contending with. And so the double-edged sword of dance is that on the one hand, you can completely escape from your Parkinson's. And many of our participants say, when I'm dancing, I don't feel that I have Parkinson's. I, I, I'm not aware of my motor symptoms. A lot of my non-motor issues related to mood, um, cognition, uh, uh, social interaction, those, those are ameliorated. Um, but our focus is, is not on Parkinson's. So when you come into the class, we don't talk about Parkinson's. We don't talk about how certain activities are good or bad for your symptoms. We really focus on you as a dancer in that space. And the double-edged sword is that, so you can escape, right? You can get out of your Parkinson's world, but on the other side, all of the things that you're working on in that class, motor skills, social interaction, uh, cognitive sequencing, cognitive switching, all of those skills are incredibly valuable for people living with Parkinson's. And so on the one hand, you don't have to focus in on the symptoms, but on the other hand, everything that dancers do and think about in our training and in our performance is directly related to, to Parkinson's. And I'm gonna use the rest of my session today to give you some examples for that. A lot of people ask me, Phil, what, what makes dance different from other forms of exercise? You know, a lot of us have heard now that exercise is really good for Parkinson's. In fact, a lot of the neurologists we talk to 
uh, and a lot of the major Parkinson's organizations nas nationally uh, say that exercise and physical activity is as important as your medication schedule. So if you take pills, but don't do any physical activity, you're, you're doing yourself a great disservice. Um, and, and so people say, well, I understand dance is physical activity. What, why can't I just go to the gym? Like what, what makes dance so special? <laughs> so I thought I'd start off with a little uh, activity to, to share that information with you and see if you can kind of get, get a sense of what makes dance um, special. So I'm gonna just uh, back up a little bit and uh, so that I can, you can actually see my body. And um, I'm gonna give you an example here. And what I, wanna, what I want us to do is just to start uh, wherever you are, I'm gonna get into the shade a little bit. Uh, I want you to start with just some gentle stretches of your wrist. So this is something you might do at home. You, your physical therapist or occupational therapist might give this to you. And you can do it on the other side as well. So just, again, stretching. Yeah. And you can do some of these flips. Some of you do this actually as part of the, your, uh, your doctor's checkup, right? Your PDRS three, turning over. Great. All right. Just a gentle stretching and rotation. And then we're just going to stretch our arms up. Beautiful, nice long reach. Stretch our arms out a little bit really reaching through your fingers, stretch your arms down. And now bringing your hands up and we're gonna do just a little circle to come back together. All right. So the way I talked about that was really as, um, as a stretching activity, right? I didn't, I didn't give you any, any other information. Now I'm gonna start giving you some imagery, okay? So as you, as you reach your hand here, I want you to imagine that you're dipping your hands into a beautifully warm bowl of water. It feels it's just the right temperature. Yeah? And the same thing on the other side. So that changes our intention. It changes our motivation, right? We're not just doing a stretch. We're thinking about the how of that stretch. We're thinking about the quality of my movement. And now as you flip your hands over, I want you to think about receiving or offering a gift. Right, so I'm not just doing this. I'm thinking about, hey, I would like to give this to you or oh, thank you so much. I will take this into my heart, yeah? So bowl of water, offering or receiving a gift. And now I want you to imagine that you're in a giant theater and there's a balcony way up there, way past the, the top seats. You, your friends are all the way up there. And so when you reach up to them, you really wanna see them. You wanna connect with them. So send your energy up to them Send your energy out to your, your audience in the, the mezzanine level. Send your energy out to the orchestra. Do a little flutter of your hands and acknowledge the whole theater in front of you, bring everyone in, right? So instead of thinking of this as a stretch, we've now thought about it as a bow and we start to have a relationship that gets to the why. Why are we doing these movements? I'm not just on a treadmill going right and left, right? I'm really thinking about the connection between my imagination and my body. All right, so there's one more, two more elements I wanna talk about. One is sequencing, right? So dancers are very much like poets. We have to think, or writers, we have to think about the phrases that we use in our movement. So I'm not just putting random words out there, right? <laughs> I'm not just throwing random words. I'm thinking about the order of those words and I'm putting them into sentences that have punctuation and those sentences are wrapped up into bigger paragraphs that have meaning, okay? So let's put these movements together. So I have a little dip and a dip and I'm gonna offer my gift and I'm gonna bring that gift back to my heart. Let's try that one more time, dip and dip and open and bring it back, right? Now I'm gonna reach up to my balcony really high reaching to the front, all the way down. Let's do one more, all the way down to the earth, sprinkling water off your fingers and bringing your hands back in, right? So I've gone from this sense of stretching into a little bit of a story. It's an abstract story, right? It doesn't necessarily connect with, uh, uh, you know, it's not Shakespeare, but there's a, a beginning, a middle and an end. And what I've now created is one or two sentences of movement that string together. And what holds all of this together and gives us what I would say the expressive and emotional connection is music. So let's try this phrase now. 
with a little bit of music all together. And I'm just going to, um, just gonna do a little switch here and then I'm gonna move back. So here we go. <laughs> Just follow along with me. Reaching out, 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 all the way up and circle. Let's try that one more time. Reaching far. Coming back together. You know, we could do that all day. <laughs> Good. All right. So I'm going to pause right there. And what I would really want to try to get at is this idea that dance is the um, sophisticated, very complex, but not difficult, uh, combination, integration of mind and heart and body, right? So we had, we started with some very simple stretching things without a lot of uh, motivation behind them. And then we started adding layers, right? The first layer was, was imagery, it gave you some images to play with, the water, the balcony, um, the gift. Then we started putting those images into a series of phrases, right? Created a sentence with them so that movement patterning, uh, which can be quite difficult for people with Parkinson's, suddenly has an internal logic, I would say even an expressive logic, right? And then we added music. And music is that, it's that wonderful glue that holds everything together. It, um, it gives us the emotional tone. It gives us a very strong sense of rhythm and pulse. And it also gives us a sense of quality. How are we doing this movement? It would be very different if I put on the Rolling Stones and did that same movement right? And that would be great too. But I happened to choose uh, Bach cello suite number three, and that had a very distinct sound to it. And that made us move in a very particular way. So one of my arguments is that people with Parkinson's benefit from dancing because they benefit from thinking like a dancer. When the challenges of Parkinson's take over, and make automatic movement more difficult. Things like walking and turning and the things that you used to do easily every day, you need to adopt the mind of a dancer because dancers are very used to having to think and, and activate from the brain all of their movement, right? We're given, as dancers, we're given very difficult co uh, choreography. The choreographer I used to work with, Mark Morris, would make something up and I would say, I, I can't, I don't, I've never seen that before. Um, and so I had to figure out a way to make that movement comfortable in my own body. And in many ways, people with Parkinson's have the same challenge, except in, in your case, life is the choreographer. Life is giving you challenges. And you have to say as a dancer, all right, I need some good strategies for navigating through life. And those strategies, the thing about dance is that we're all born with the ability to dance to music. We all dance as kids, some level, right? Whether we do that formally or informally, we all have that. So we need to be able to use those tools and uh, harness the, the, the process, the thought process of professional dancers to navigate through our life. And a lot of what we work on as class is building those skills so that it, they become second nature in real life. Having trouble with a certain corner in your house, having trouble with stairs, come up with an image for that, come up with a story, come up with a motivation, think like an actor or a dancer, so that it's not just a rote skill that you're, tr you're struggling with, but there's some kind of image that is driving you forward. Maybe you're walking up uh, the stairway to, to the promised land. Maybe you're picking flowers along the way. Maybe you are um, uh, in, uh, what's that wonderful scene? in uh, American Paris, right, where he's walking down and all the, the stairs light up as he's going down. Um, and, and so you have to come up with images that really allow you to get through some of, the, some of the roadblocks that you encounter physically. And on top of that, dance gives us a chance to express ourselves. What we see in our classes is that people with Parkinson's who so often um, are losing the, the expressive tools that are available to us as human beings, right? Voice, face, and body, 
those things become more difficult. So dance gives us a chance to express through our body once again uh, in a safe environment. So I'm gonna give you another example here. Um, and this is really going, we're gonna, I'm gonna break out each of those elements out very quickly and give us a chance to explore a little bit more. So I'm gonna talk first about image. And I, I'm going to invite you now to come up with your own interpretation of my cues. So we're gonna do a little painting and it doesn't matter what color walls you have at home. Could be, could be white walls, could already have color on them, but you're gonna take out some, some paints and I want you to create uh, wonderful drawings, scribbles, doodles all over those walls. And I'm gonna give you some cues along the way, okay? So um, I'm just gonna take a moment to shift a little bit out of the direct sun. It's a little bit easier to see me. All right, so let's try this and I'm gonna give us some cues along the way. And I want you to just start by picking up two paintbrushes. So here are your brushes. And I want you to imagine that you're just tracing lines of color on the wall. You can start with one hand and then transfer to the other as you start to get comfortable with this, but really see the colors that you're making around you. Is it orange? Is it red? Is it more of a delicate green? See if you can keep the flow of movement, whatever you're drawing, don't let the ink blot up in one chunk, right? Try to keep it moving. And as you start getting more comfortable, see if you can introduce both hands, both brushes simultaneously. They can also work together. your whole hand to smear that paint. You try that for me. So maybe thinking more of like a Van Gogh texture. So really thick paint, really getting that oil paint onto the canvas, dabbing it on, very thick. Yeah. Pressing, really feeling the oil paint oozing between your fingers. Nice. And now I just want you to dab very lightly all around the canvas that is surrounding you. Thinking about little points of color, you can think about Georges Seurat, the uh, pointillist artist who really used these tiny little dots of energy of color all around to create these massive canvases. So little dots, beautiful. And changing gears again, I want you to think about Jackson Pollock. So drop your brushes and just splatter that paint out. Right, splatter on the wall, splatter on the person next to you, throw it out to me, I'm gonna throw it out to you. Pow, right, so really strong throws. Try to visualize where that paint is going. Think about the different patterns you're making on the wall and on the floor and on the ceiling. And now scraping all of that paint up, kind of bringing it in scraping it off the walls, coming into a little paintball, pressing all of that oil paint together, really feel it tactily, and then starting to grow and expand that ball of color all the way out, as big as you can. And relaxing down, and just take a moment to look around. See what paint is left on those walls. Look at all the patterns. Nice. Good. And bringing that paint in one more time. And now offering it to me, and I'll offer it to you. Reaching, reaching, reaching. So in that, I'm really, um, I'm not giving you particular phrases, so to speak. I'm, I'm just giving you some images and your brain is taking those images, right? Those different styles of painting and manifesting that as movement, right? So 
what we're doing is we're taking some things. Now, if you were to take out the music and take out the imagery and just show a film of that to your neurologist, they might say, wow, you're moving, you're moving with a lot of amplitude. You're moving with a lot of intention. Uh, you're moving with specificity. Your, uh, your movement quality is, is strong and direct. And that's great. But all of that was happening through your imagination, right? So in that case, we used imagery to access movement that might otherwise be more difficult for you. And that I would argue is what dance can do. It provides a roadmap for people to move that's very tangible, very clear, and that uses parts of our brain that are still very much active, the imagination, the sense of expression, right? In, in cases where we're not on Zoom, social interaction is a huge motivation. Something else we talked about earlier was this idea of sequencing and narrative. So I'm going to give you an example of that, and we're going to do a little baseball together. Um, because for me and for our participants, often a, a movement that's, that's recognizable or tangible is easier to do than something that is sort of from the dance lexicon. So if I go through the ballet positions, people say, oh, okay, well, that's interesting, but I'm not sure I've ever done that before. When we're talking about something like baseball, people recognize a lot of these gestures, and they're also based on very um, fundamental movement qualities. So we're gonna do uh, five different things in our baseball game. We're gonna play the role of the catcher. We're gonna play the role of the pitcher. We're gonna be a batter. We're then gonna run, and then we're gonna slide into first base, okay? We're gonna do that twice through. Don't worry, this will all be seated. And then we're gonna run the tape backwards. Now, choreographers call this process a retrograde. Retrograde means you're taking those same, that same sentence and you're running it from back to front. Kind of like an instant replay, but going, going backwards in, in slow motion. So we're gonna try that. Um, I love this activity because again, I'm teaching you or sharing with you a choreographic skill, a way that dancers have to think about movement that's actually very useful for people with Parkinson's because it makes you very conscious of your movement. It makes you have to think about those movements and not rely on the automatic, okay? So uh, I'm not gonna give you a lot of uh, introduction to this. We're gonna go right into it, it's nice and steady and slow so you'll be able to follow along. And I want you to imagine that you are, um, you are dancing a baseball game. So what I mean by that is, uh, all of your gestures here want to be a little bit exaggerated. It's like you're playing baseball, but it's at the Metropolitan Opera House. So you want every gesture to be seen all the way back to that balcony we were, we were bowing to before the beginning of our session. All right. So follow along and put some music on for this. And here we go. <laughs> Adjustment here. You now you know what the music sounds like. I'm just going to do a little adjustment of my screen so that you can see that bench. All right, perfect. All right, here we go.
Oops. Sorry, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, there's there's one way to ride a bike. Uh, there's one way to to walk to walk on a treadmill, right? We're not really thinking about the qualities, but dancers are always thinking about the how, not just the what. And this is really important for people living with Parkinson's because when we think about the how and think about the motivation, we are tapping into, again, our creative powers, our imagination, and our ability to think mindfully about our movement. So again, we can rely less and less on the automatic and more and more on the conscious. And dancers are very conscious in everything that we do. So we're going to take just one set, that same phrase going forward, but now what we call an adagio. Adagio in Italian means slowly. So we're going to do the same movement very slowly and mindfully in a way that makes us think about this movement in a different way, right? Again, really connecting mind to body. So let's try this. We know the movement already and we're going to do the same tune, but nice and slowly. Here we go. Low pitch, grabbing that bat, one slow run, and a slide, same on the other side, really slow like you're moving through water, pitching, grabbing that bat, Big, slow swing around. One run. And a big, beautiful, slow slide. Reach, 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 reach. Yeah. Great. So we've talked so far about imagery. We've talked about sequencing. And we're going to finish up with um, this idea of expression because, yes, dance is a physical activity. And sometimes we dance just because we feel the beats. But really, dance has evolved over thousands of years to be a form of human expression, perhaps even uh, earlier than, than speech. We don't know. But... Um, Certainly, uh, it has evolved as a way for humans to tell stories, to share history, to share culture, um, and that tradition comes right up to today. So in, in all of the choreography that's going on now, you still see that emphasis on story, on expression. And as I think about Parkinson's, I think about um, kind of an anti-theatrical uh, condition, right, where your your modes of expression, whether that's through your face or through your voice, as, as Dr. Phil talks about, um, or or through your body, right? The ability to express with your hands, big movements, or the integration of all of those elements, right? Face, voice, body becomes more difficult. So in dance, we often are uh, connecting the energy of our bodies with something we want to say, or in some cases, in some cases, playing a role. So I thought I'd finish our session today with a little bit of a story that I think most of us know. Uh, this is Romeo and Juliet. Um, and this is a scene from the, the story ballet of Romeo and Juliet, which is taken directly from the play. So if you've never seen the ballet, but you know the play a little bit, you're good. Um, Mercutio and the other, um, the other Montagues come to the ball and they're not really supposed to be there. Um, so they come in masks, and they, as you know from the play, Mercutio is kind of a, a wise guy. He's, he's a trickster. He's a, a prankster. He's a wit, right? We know this from the language, the wonderful language that Shakespeare uses, and that's captured in the choreography. So we're going to do a little tribute to Mercutio and the other, um, the other Montagues who are at this ball surreptitiously. They're not really supposed to be there, but they're also kind of playing with authority a little bit. They're saying, hey, look at me, I'm here, but not really. So uh, we, have a, we have some kind of Italian style gestures. Hey, how you doing? Like, nice to meet you. We're gonna point 
So you're going to see a couple of people. Maybe you see another Montague across the room, and you're saying, hey, I see you behind your mask. We're going to put on a mask and take off a mask. And we're going to do a little festive celebration of the fact that we are, we are about to do a, you know, a dance all together. Um, we're then going to do a little rhythm, rhythmic pulse. So we're going to do some beats in our heels, in our knees, and some clapping. And I'll lead you through that. And then some more looking around. A little bit warily now. I'm not sure if you're really, if you've been noticed. And maybe you're going to tell your, your groupies to be quiet. And we'll go back and repeat that. At the very end, in this wonderful music by Prokofiev, um, there's a little foreshadowing, right? You don't get to foreshadow at the gym, but in dance class, we get to do a little foreshadowing. Foreshadowing is knowing something that's coming ahead in the story. And we're going to foreshadow to the balcony scene. So stay tuned for that, a little surprise treat at the end, um, where we again the balcony scene is the most romantic part of the play and also of the, the ballet. So we'll do some arm gestures to reflect that. All right, let's go right into our, uh, our dance mask ball um, from, uh, from Romeo and Juliet. And there's a, the, the introduction here is a little bit quiet, so just stay tuned. I'm gonna turn the music up just a tiny bit so you can hear it. Ready? Gathering your crowd. Saying hello to people, hey. And pointing out some familiar faces. This can be really strong. Again, Mercutio's character is pretty playful. Maps and unmaps. Ready to dance. Let's try that one more time. So gathering your friends around. Pointing out some other folks you see in the audience or in the, in the party. Nice. Better hide yourself before you're found out. Nice. Hey. They call it sprezzatura in Italian, right? That kind of pride. Heels. Heels. Knees. Clap. Let's repeat. Heels. One more time. Looking around. Shh. Back to the beginning. Reach. Hey. Hey. Good. Strong point. Really crushing your body. Nice. Beautiful. Covering your face. Not sure you want to be revealed. Boy, again. Opening. And proud. I think we should be proud one more time. Nice big reach to the sky. And now here's our foreshadowing. Here you are, out in the balcony scene. Reaching all the way up. Coming into your heart. Same on the other side. Reach. Coming into your heart. And letting your heart expand up to that balcony. All the way up. Reaching out. All right, great. Yeah, we've got the whole uh, story there in just about two minutes. So pretty good. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna stop there because I wanna see if um, there are questions that, uh, that remain to be answered and just give us a chance to kind of wrap things up. Dr. Dr. Schneider, is there anything that you want to ask? Yes, but always before asking a word of gratitude. That was amazing. <laughs> uh, it was great to participate and not to make it an intellectual think, uh, experience, but to feel it. And um, I was having a very rough time with my own body right before getting on this Zoom call. And that felt so physically, emotionally, like a wash. Mm -hmm. So I really viscerally got it. Like, I can't wait to attend some of your classes. Mm -hmm. And we shared when I met you uh, a few days ago that uh, my sister has been enjoying your classes and they've had a tremendous impact. So 
first of all, again, thank you for what you do and continue to do and, and spread this out. This is great. And your, your explanation and your pulling it together was amazing. What a gift. So My yes, pleasure. we have a couple of questions. Uh, great. First, a few that just came through. Um, one is somebody, and maybe this is actually Dr. Qu uh, it's actually Dr. Resack and Dr. Fabulon. Uh, I'm going to hold on that one and start in the beginning. Could you tell a little bit about some of the things that you've happened that you've seen in people over time as they participate in dance? Mm -hmm. So I I try to be very very careful um, in describing the effects and benefits of dance. Um, if you're interested in the, in the scientific literature on this, there are more than 38 published studies on the impact of dance for people with Parkinson's, um, going all the way back to 2008 or nine um, with some of the early Argentine tango studies going all the way up till, till now with studies done on our program. Um, they all point to changes, particularly in motor skill, um, but also non-motor things, cognition, which is always a, a difficult one to measure, um, uh, mood, social isolation, um, depression, and some of those, those things have been studied as well. So I want to leave that conversation for, this, for the scientists because they, they, are, um, they are qualified to talk about sort of the scientific anal analysis. What I want to talk about is my perspective from a dance, a dance background. And what I see is that over time, people become more proficient, more confident, more expressive dancers. That, without saying it, has some intense, uh, intensely positive repercussions on Parkinson's symptoms as well, because obviously if someone's becoming better at something like rhythm or more musical in their dancing, they have the ability to apply that to their daily life. So something like walking, which can be quite difficult. They're able to then apply a steady rhythm to their walking and actually walk uh, with a more consistent gait, uh, stride, stride, pattern. Um, so, so I see people becoming better musically. They're able to incorporate music more into their, into their physical uh, body, both in class and outside of class. I see amplitude changing considerably. So people coming in in what I would call sort of a, a Parkinson's bubble, right? Very close in. And at the end of class, being able to find a bigger range of movement. And then over time, seeing that range get, get bigger and bigger. From a cognitive standpoint, people are able over time to learn much more uh, complicated and much longer phrases of movement. And I see that through dancers of all levels, right? The more you practice learning something, the better you get. But it's particularly surprising in Parkinson's because we're told that that kind of short-term memory and that kind of uh, cognitive switching can be quite difficult. But over time with practice, people become better at it. They become better at learning those uh, those longer phrases and better at executing them. And finally, I see uh, this often doesn't get talked about because I think we're so focused on sort of the, the motor skills and, and gait and tremor and those really kind of cardinal symptoms. But for today, I think it's really important to talk about the community that gets formed in these classes. So when people come together in a dance class, they are even on Zoom, they are they see themselves as part of one community doing something meaningful and creative together. And that gives people a sense of connection and belonging at whatever level they're at. So there's no, there's no right or wrong in our class. There's no feeling that you're not doing it as well as somebody else. You are there and you're contributing as best as you can. And everybody in that room, whether it's a live or virtual your room, recognizes you and witnesses you moving with them. And that's a very important sense of connection, I think, particularly right now. Um, that, that is one of the biggest benefits of the class. So people who've come in say to me, I was really alone before coming to this class. I didn't know, I didn't have a social network. I stopped working 10 years ago and I lost that network. Mm -hmm. And this is now my circle of friends. These are, these are my buddies and these are people that I not only dance with, but then connect with off hours, right? I have meals with them or this time we provide breakout rooms to our Zoom sessions so people can connect. And I think that sense of social belonging um, and anti-loneliness is incredibly important and an incredibly important development that, is, that happens in a dance class. I am so glad that you are doing what you are doing and doing it so well and having such a wonderful impact in people's lives. Um, we're gonna switch venue for a moment now, and, but I wanna let everybody know we're gonna have the delightful opportunity to 
uh, when we're ready to end our visit today, our lunch and learn, uh, we will end with another opportunity for David to lead us through an, a, a movement experience. David, thank you. Delightful. My pleasure. Thank you. A pleasure to be part of it with you. I'd like to welcome back Dr. Rizak and introduce Dr. Jennifer Pallone to join us for a Q&A. Dr. Jennifer Pallone is a board certified neurologist with over 25 years of clinical experience, caring and devoted to, uh, as part of this work to people with Parkinson's disease. She currently practices at Nuvance Health Movement Disorders Center in Poughkeepsie, New York, based at Vassar Brothers Medical Center, providing neurologic care to patients with movement disorders, including Parkinson's disease. Dr. Pallone, Dr. Rizak, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm waiting for you to come up on screen. Um, so I don't see Dr. Rizak. Is he with us? I am. Ah, I hear you, but I don't yet see you. Yes, me. Dr. Pallone. So, uh, Dr. Pallone right here. Great. So mm -hmm. I'll start throwing out some questions that people have asked, and uh, they, they were almost all covered in your overview introduction, Dr. Rizak, but here we go. Okay. Well, the first one to come up was the issue of apathy, the sense that uh, well, maybe what is apathy and how does that, how, what have you seen how, uh, as it relates to Parkinson's? Um, I'm going to have Dr. Pallone answer. I was say, I'll, I'll start with that one. Everyone can hear me? Yeah. Okay. So apathy is an interesting term. I think we've all <clears throat> experienced it at different times. Uh, the fact that we just don't have the interest maybe or the mental energy to want to do something. So it's that flat um, mood and can't get active, can't get your energy going. Um, I would say that you have to distinguish that from depression. Uh, probably one of the most important things we need to, to differentiate it from that and the fatigue of Parkinson's and the sleepiness of Parkinson's that takes your energy. Apathy is an actual symptom in and of itself though and it's probably along the lines of a cognitive or behavioral um, block that patients have towards getting interested in things and caring about things. So families get very frustrated with an apathetic person because they can't get them motivated. And we know that all these things we're talking about today could make someone feel better, could make their performance better, their enjoyment of life better, the quality of life will be better, and yet we can't get them to do it. So it's a very frustrating symptom for a, um, someone who's close to you to uh, deal with. Apathy in and of itself, I guess, is something that we don't exactly treat with a medicine. Uh, it comes back to a lot of the things we've been talking about today and trying to stimulate the brain in a more fun way um, that picks up the mood and picks up the energy, maybe gets connects with a different part of the person's brain to get them energized. So it's really not something we, we would treat with a pill. It's really something that we treat with uh, positive energy. And there's a lot of ways to stimulate that as we've learned from, from David today. I think we all felt a, a little, hopefully, a little elevation and stimulation from that and less apathetic uh, oh, today. Sure. So. Thank you, beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, a question comes up about concentration and, and, and another question, the same idea of concentration comes up with the word focus, having difficulty focusing, having difficulty concentrating. Are there any things, be they exercises, be they whatever, uh, that can be done to make it easier for a person to spend more time in focused thought? I, you know, concentration, uh, focus, attention is uh, very common. Those problems are common in Parkinson's patients who happen to have some cognitive uh, issues. And um, again, doing things that are interesting uh, with David, for example, or uh, whatever a person really enjoys doing, um, reading, keeping that mind active, and then qu actually quizzing the person sometimes can uh, improve focus. And if, you're, if there's something boring going on, the person who has a focus problem or an attentional problem is going to uh, lose that, uh, any ability to incorporate information because they're not paying attention. And so it appears that their memory may be impacted 
But in fact, what's really happening is they're not registering any memories because they're not paying attention to what's going on. And that's something that we try to sort out in the office, but sometimes we need neuropsychologists to help us with that, uh, to really get down to the nitty gritty. Uh, and there are some medications sometimes that for the right patient under the right circumstances that can enhance uh, a focus. For example, some sort of stimulants sometimes can be uh, helpful, but we do that in conjunction with the primary care doctor and uh, sometimes with a psychiatrist as well. Can you think of any stories that have come? I mean, you've got probably thousands of stories that you've experienced as people go down their roads of dealing with these things. Can you think of some different and one or two that might be of interest? Well, I mean, I certainly have had and I'm sure Dr. Pallone as well, I've had patients who really, uh, families were very upset. It's usually the families that are more upset and telling me about uh, they can't get the person to concentrate, to sit still, to look at you know, a, a piece of paper or, or watch television or anything, anything like that. There's just no concentration and focus. And um, we have utilized um, Ritalin, drugs like that, for the right patient, I must, again, add, you know, the phrase that everybody hears is if you've seen one patient with Parkinson's, you've only seen one patient with Parkinson's because everybody's different. But for the right patient, a, a stimulant uh, can, can activate the connections between the basal ganglia and the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is very involved in, in these kinds of issues, who's not functioning just right. Uh, frontal lobe has to do with sequencing, has to do with uh, advanced planning, and it has to do with attention. And sometimes we can boost the activity of the frontal lobe, not connect that circuit to help us with patients. Uh, now they can play the piano. They love piano. They could not focus on playing the piano, and they're able to focus, and, and that really has given them a lot of pleasure. Plus, in mo in, they move, and any movement is... Uh, Without that, we're in trouble. So we really need patients to keep moving. I don't know, Jennifer, uh, I don't know if you have another story? Of course, there's various stories over the years. A part of what really makes us happy about what we do every day. It's uh, very important to think about the whole family dynamics and the person who has difficulty with their mental focus can't take part in conversations. They find that other people are having the conversation. They cannot really concentrate on what's going on, so they can't involve themselves, and they feel withdrawn because of that. There's a whole cascade of problems, and definitely through really attention to detail with our with uh, people that we're working with it's it's looking at a lot of different factors of how we can improve their mental function, not just that one particular thing of concentration, but what's happening with their sleep, what's happening with their medications, are they on a new medicine that's now interfering with their thinking. Um, Dr. Rezek said earlier, making sure medically that people are as balanced as they can be. If you pay attention to details, you can accomplish a lot for people. And then there's certainly the factors of neurochemistry that we might be able to alter through medications. We find that when patients don't actually have enough dopamine, that's another factor that keeps them from focusing and concentrating. That's a really important part of it, that there can be some cognitive improvements just by getting the dopamine levels um, up to a point where there's a little more normality. So if you're helping them physically, you'll, you'll oftentimes notice that they are mentally um, a little faster too. And then we do have some medications, which we use to just increase a chemical in the brain called acetylcholine. So we talk a lot about dopamine and Parkinson's, but um, as we often also explain to people, it's a tip of the iceberg because there are other neurochemicals we can work on. So in doing those things, I've absolutely been able to get a person back into enjoying their life, going places with their family, um, enjoying family events, being able to go back to church services and feel like they can be part of it. We absolutely can improve quality of life. Absolutely. Well, that's helpful to hear. Uh, and it also makes one appreciate that there is so much for you on the professional side to know and understand and think about and to take all that knowledge that you've accumulated and to apply it to people's life stories as you listen to them and try to find the best fit. 
uh, along the lines of another couple of words come up, anxiety, nervousness, what to do about it, uh, what do we know about that? Uh, any thoughts? Uh -huh. Should I jump right back yeah, in? Why don't you jump in? <laughs> yeah, you're in, so stay All in. Right. Anxiety and depression are neurochemical as well, and that's true in all of us. And in Parkinson's patients, there is an increased likelihood of developing depression and anxiety, and sometimes that even occurs in the years before the motor symptoms. So back to the, the group of symptoms that Dr. Rizak um, also mentioned is the non-motor symptom. So it can be something that's early on. It may be that change, you know, and people don't know why. Why am I getting anxious? Why am I depressed? And there isn't an obvious reason in their life. And then we find out over time, then maybe the diagnosis of, of Parkinson's disease or something else that leads to putting the whole picture together. So it is part of the neurochemistry of Parkinson's, not so much dopamine dependent entirely. Although if we balance the dopamine better again, then people feel even emotionally better and their anxiety is less. When, their Parkinson, when the Parkinson's medicine is not working, there can be that gap in the, we call it off time or the wearing off time. And during that, oftentimes there is an anxiety that rises and in fact, almost a panic attack for some people, it's terrible. So that can be one of the things we need to do in treating the anxiety is to identify is it in a pattern through the day or is it just been like this ever since the beginning of developing Parkinson's and not knowing it? There are medications, absolutely, that there's a lot of medicines to treat, and, treat uh, depression and anxiety. But I think starting first, we usually try to identify things that, again, it's elevate that mood, music, dance, um, do something fun. You know, we need good energy in our lives every day to balance out the negatives. And in order to do that with Parkinson's, you might even need a little bit more help and would consider medications. But not always. It's not always 100% necessary. We know that better sleep again helps mood. And we know that exercise and the right kind of enjoyable exercise helps mood. So I would still emphasize those. Yeah, I, I think David could really help a lot with these kinds of mm -hmm. problems. Uh, he's fantastic, by the way. It was great. Um, but I do think, as I mentioned earlier, we want to be sure that there are no other medical problems that might be causing people to feel depressed mm -hmm. or anxious or not think well. And I mean, something simple like checking a B12 level, B12 deficiencies can, can they call it the great imitator can cause people to have neuropathies, to have spinal cord injuries, to be depressed, to have, be, have appear to have a dementia. So simple things that are usually not really looked at by most physicians. We check uh, vitamin D levels, D3 levels have been involved and in, uh, shown to be involved in cognition now. There are D3 receptors in the brain. When a person, Dr. Rizek, when a person goes for a general physical, can you hear me? Yes. When a person goes for a general physical exam, just an annual or something, uh, a standard blood test is done by an internist. So they typically look at B12 and uh, D3 levels, or are they typically not included? Not as much as it should be, no. And I always tell my patients when they're, next time you go for your physical, ask them to check. I mean, I could do that separately, but if they're going to be within the next month or two going to their primary care doctors, then just tell them we need a B12 and a D3 level. And so as far um, as educating people, it yeah. doesn't cost them any more blood to mention to their interns, by the way, when you have the labs done, include those levels. Yes, and I mean, I, I, I'm sure Dr. Pallone has had patients like this, but I had a patient uh, uh, who uh, actually the son called me as a friend actually and said, like over the last month, the patient has become increasingly demented, confused, uh, delusional. And so I, they went to their doctors and no one checked the B12 level. I, they came to me, I checked the B12, it was almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. We replaced it quickly and of course you can't wait too long. So, and the person returned to their baseline. So that was probably one of the most dramatic uh, for me as a physician um, uh, effects. I've never really seen a B12 uh, replacement act that quickly, but it was, fin it was, a, it was amazing. So we had simple things, we can't, 
leave any attention to detail right attention to detail no, it's nice to hear that there's some right. simple things which lead to mm -hmm. simple and safe things that can be done that could be very helpful we get the aha moment you yeah. know when we find these things and uh, just to reiterate something to dr rezac uh, the thyroid so if your thyroid is sluggish so will be you will be as well and that includes mentally emotionally physically so and if it's overactive, you can be very anxious. And very and, nervous uh, and very you know, shaky. And looks, and if you have Parkinson's, everyone attributes everything to Parkinson's. So if somebody comes in with a hangnail, <laughs> that's your Parkinson's. Uh, you know, the, the general physicians do I'm taking that. notes here. So it reads hangnail <laughs> Parkinson's. And it may, sometimes it's not. It's actually a problem in and of itself that needs to be corrected. So just uh, we have to be aware of these things. We have one more piece on this segment, so a chance for one more question here, which is, are there any dietary things that can slow down these various uh, affective and cognitive issues? I'll let that, she's very big on diet. Dr. <laughs> well, we should all be. <laughs> all right. <laughs> the, the, uh, I look at it this way, uh, it's a general health issue with Parkinson's, and I tell patients that's as your chance as a person with Parkinson's, this is your chance to be the healthiest you've been. Now's the time. Because the better you take care of yourself in general, the better that you're going to, the better things will go for your Parkinson's over decades. I mean, we're talking about, a, about an illness that is going, going to be with you over decades. Well, unless, you know, our, our prayers come through and there's um, even more dramatic um, breakthroughs and cures, but we have to think about this for the long term. So um, the diet that should be followed is probably one that approaches and treats multiple things that are going on with people to keep them healthy. There is a uh, the Mediterranean diet, a cardiac diet, there's one that's um, the MIND diet, M-I-N-D, and these can be looked up. They're basically emphasizing the right oils, um, colorful fruits and vegetables, a small amount of nuts daily, um, and very low on red meats, um, kind of some simple things. So colorful diets and really fresh food is still better uh, than supplements if we can do that. It's not always the easiest thing to do to incorporate, you know, cooking and fresh food into every day. But they've, there's no doubt that that healthy, really um, clean diet is going to be a positive for your Parkinson's. We think of it as um, higher in antioxidants as well. So that's the colorful fruits and vegetables, a lot of supplements that are um, out there and advertised for Parkinson's patients, which uh, you know can be very overwhelming. There's a lot of information out there. They're, they're really, most of them are based on an antioxidant pr um, principle that, it, that that's going to lower toxicity in your body as an antioxidant. So that's where a lot of, of supplements come from and where the, the talk about the colorful fruits and vegetables comes from. That's helpful. So if a person has that in mind, it's a good place to look to see what they can do to maximize their health. And I like the idea that the Parkinson's can stimulate you to wind up leading a healthier life than you had before. Absolutely. And to summarize this segment for both of our guests here, Dr. Palau and Dr. Rizak, there's a great comment that just came on the chat. So it's taken right out of where I probably was going to say. It's, it is so great to hear from clinicians who really understand there's a whole picture here and care about a whole person, not a, and I'll add my own, not just a part of a person, not just one system, because we are unified beings and that you think about the comprehensive picture and, and go on with thoughtful solutions, both from a chemical support point of view, a medicinal point of view, from a diet, from an exercise, from an activity, from a quality of life point of view. So uh, I Wherever share Wherever your great... strengths, yeah, you draw yeah. from the things that as a person are more important to you. If that's uh, faith-based for some people, whatever's going to give you a positive, I, I think of a positive attitude is actually um, a chemical effect in your brain. So, Beautiful. and a good one. Beautiful. Yeah. That's right. Thank you so much. And uh, there are plenty of people attending right now who still have more questions. So we invite you to send your questions to ask the doctors at parkinsonswellnessproject.org. Ask the doctors at parkinsonswellnessproject.org. And uh, everybody on the team here will do all they can to respond in whatever time frame they can. But uh, thanks for the questions. Thank you, Dr. Pallone. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Resack. Thank you. Thank you.
and we have a delightful another guest that I'd like to introduce, um, and a man I just recently met, Arlen Bennett. And Arlen Bennett started something called the Healing Project. And when asked to write his bio statement for this too, we could introduce him. He said the following, I am a husband, a father, a songwriter, a music maker, and oh yeah, a Parkinson's warrior. I love it. The Healing Project is the name that he gave to his effort to heal himself from Parkinson's dis-ease. It is also the name of his effort to use music to help heal himself and to inspire healing in others and to create Parkinson's awareness. He kicked off the Healing Project in 2013 when he invited a dozen performing songwriters whose lives have been touched in some way by neurologic issues like ALS, MS, and PD. And he asked each of them to share an original song. This experience was inspiring, therapeutic, and healing. And we're going to have the, the, a treat to hear and see a piece of Arlen's art, artistry and creativity uh, in a song. The lyrics are very powerful. The song is called A World of Possibilities and it is written by the lyrics and the music and performed by Arlen. So uh, when we're ready here, we're gonna cue that up. You can roll, yeah, you can do almost anything, yeah, anything. If you can think, you can dream, if you can dream, you can fly, fly, you can seek, seek and you will find the missing piece to the puzzle of your life. The one that disappeared Just when things were going right Close your eyes and you will see A broken world is A world of possibility
Wow. Wow. You made my eyes water. I hope everybody was able to hear that and focus on your words. Arlen, thank you so much. What a gift. What a gift. Having some difficulty hearing you. Can you hear me okay? It's a little bit quiet. I don't know if we have any more volume, and I don't know if there anybody else. Thank you. A little better? You do. I think so. Let me hear again. I'm not getting it. Do other people having trouble with the volume? Yes. Okay. I think somehow it's off completely. Mm. I heard the mm. Yeah, that mic doesn't seem to be on. Ah, I hear some sound there. No. There's soft sound there, Arlen. Hello? Better? Yeah, I'm getting you, but it's still very soft. I'll get closer. How's that? That'll be wonderful. We all want to get closer. <laughs> uh, Arlen, that was a tremendous gift to the world. I hope that everybody I know gets to hear that song and see the visuals that go with it. It's just so real, so right on. How did you, uh, I, I would love, I, I, I see you're geared up with your guitar. I had a couple of questions for you. Would you like to use your guitar first or share some questions and thoughts? Um, I have a share some questions right now. Just make sure my voice is coming out okay. Okay, it's soft, but I hear you. Okay. Uh, so I guess I'd love, I'd love to have a chance to hear a, a word about what happened in your Wait. journey. Oh, now but I got it, loud volume there. Let's make, let's make sure that we can hear Arlen before we go any. Sure. Any Arlen, so sure. work on your sound a little bit. It's okay. Yeah, we, got, we got to hear you better. Is this good? No. It's, it's very, very low. Just keep trying. You, you, you got it. Because I, I love what Arlen has to sing, and I oh, want yeah. everybody to hear him. A hundred percent. And every time I watch that video, I am just in, enthralled. And I love seeing him jump around also. And then the doctor visit. Do other people see the chat with the lyrics? I just have some amplification if that helps. Oh, that's, okay, that's getting better. Let's see, try it again. The reason the room PA, maybe that helps better. Yeah, just speak a little louder. How's that? Better. Better? I'm using the room, my room PA here. Yeah. What? What? I'm using my room PA. Your room PA? PA? Okay, can you raise up the volume? It's pretty high, it's pretty loud now. Okay, as long as you project, we'll, we will probably be okay. Okay. Okay, so. I think Michael. you were going to tell us about World of Possibilities, right? Right, Phil? Take it away. Carl and I was interested in, in hearing a little bit about what happened to your voice when you started dealing with these, with this Parkinson's stuff and your guitar playing and a little bit about the journey of finding out you were challenged and then coming back to, to do all the great things you're doing. Well, uh, it was, uh, it's been a, it's been a uh, roller coaster ride for sure. Um, I was diagnosed in 2010 and uh, kind of had been working on a CD project, my fourth CD called, uh, which became a world of possibility uh, based on that and my diagnosis. So I kind of, you know, went forward um, as strong as I could. I started the healing project and uh, naturally us uh, PD warriors tend to go things full force into trying to beat this thing as best we can. We, we become amazing students of the brain <laughs> and health and everything like that. We, we kind of go forth and. Uh, and we try to figure this whole thing out. And I was one of those that kind of earned a, a neuropsycho degree in, uh, from Dr. Google. And uh, 
and I became very well versed in all these things and acetylcholine and dopamine. And Anything and specific that you did that was helpful to your voice? Yes, it was. And, um, and I, I just kept at it, you know, and my, my, some of my abilities on guitar playing kind of went, went south for a while. And I was one of those, you know, who believed I could conquer this without drugs, without, you know, try to approach it holistically, naturally. I exercised it. I did, I do, I did and do everything I can still. But it was the, uh, it was kind of the medic, right, right formula that I kind of worked on that, uh, using the, the standard uh, L-DOPA combination of covered up and L-DOPA, which was a big deal for me. I mean, I did, I still do all the other things, the diet, all the things, but there's no question that the brain needs that component to kind of put together what it needs to, you know, what it needs to, to keep your body and brain work functioning properly. So I find that when I gave it that, um, those things, the symptoms roll back and to me anyway. So I, you know, I didn't, was not able to play my guitar that well for a long time, for a couple of years, because I stayed away from the L-Dopa combination. And eventually I worked it back into my, um, regimen and kind of, kind of, tidied it up as I went and you know a couple of years ago and all of a sudden I was doing that again. We're all happy you're doing that again. How about your voice? Was there anything specific you did to help yourself get your voice going? Well the, the whole rollback affected lots of my symptoms so the voice got better but I do get tired so you know later on today uh, I wouldn't be as clear as I am now. Uh, so it depends on the on off kind of thing and also just the length of the day and the one thing i learned from you was the water thing <laughs> the water thing let's hear it for the water thing thank you very much for that pretty cheap Sound harmless and good for a lot of parts of our lives very much so and the brain is made of a lot of it and the body is and it makes sense to give it what it needs so uh that's a big part of it and um and uh i lost my train of thought which is not uncommon with us <laughs> so Give me, well, I need a moment also. I want to take a look because uh, a bunch of people have sent some questions and I need to check them myself. Yeah. Somebody, uh, there were a couple of questions about performance and being a performer and how do you manage your, your needs to deal with the Parkinson's around the issue of perhaps having a schedule when you have to show up and be in top form and it may not be the right moment and that kind of thing. That's a, that's a big part of it. You know, early on, um, I, uh, I formed the Healing Project. There's also a band. So I got a, had some friends of mine that were great, great, great musicians and I was without my guitar. So they supported me musically. And I went out there and I just did that, had to, had to sing. And I found that I could do that reliably. You know, the guitar was unreliable at the time, but singing was pretty reliable. So I, that's how I, I kind of monitored that as I went forward. And we just rehearsed and uh, my, my block of time to rehearse was kind of uh, tight because I have, I'm good for about an hour singing. And we'd uh, do that. And uh, when I got tired, they knew it and we'd stop rehearsing and, and go on when the gig was, we just knew that that kind of window uh, had to be kind of followed for me. Um, and um, and then as the guitar has come back, I've kind of been trying to monitor how I respond. And I find that generally for me, um, if I watch what I eat earlier in the day, like I can play the guitar now well. Mm. You know? But if yeah. I've eaten a big protein-filled breakfast or lunch, I might be having problems right now. So I kind of, right now, with respect to performing uh, like this at From Home and doing live streaming, which is something I'm working on, um, I just make sure that I, you know, have a low-carb breakfast and stay away from the proteins uh, before I perform, because otherwise I'll, I'll not look as good as I might look now. Well, you look great and you sound great. And uh, I like the message here, you know, learning how your body works, taking note of it, going forward, but adapting as you go, doing what you need to do whether it's with your medication, whether it's with your diet, your exercise schedule, sleep. Uh, I have an interesting thing being challenged with my voice also is that I find that when I need to really schedule important things, I adapt around it. And usually this whole body, mind, motions all together thing, when I have to be on, somehow it, it often shows up. 
sometimes when it, just the whole elevation of being on uh, may bring the best out. That's you true. Sometimes I think to myself, I shouldn't feel this good, but I do. <laughs> That's a great one. Just go with it. <laughs> uh, you're geared up with the guitar. Do you have something else you're, you're looking to share with us? Um, let's see. Well, I've got a new, uh, new sort of EP out. And uh, on it is a song that I wrote uh, uh, a long time ago, actually, that I kind of brought back into the fold because it kind of went along with um, the whole recovery, whole, you know, moving forward and, and not giving up kind of thing, which uh, I'm all about. And many, many PD warriors are. I think you're, if you almost kiss the microphone, we'll probably get a little more. The most Wait, is this, is this, excuse me, is this the song that we're going to play with David at the end? I just missed that. Oh, yes, but I can do another one. Is this the song that we're all going to dance to? We're not up to the end uh, piece yet. <laughs> on. I think we should save the, the, the piece that we're going to use for David at, uh, after Good. we have our closing comments in a few moments. I have, how about this? I have something in progress that uh, I just have a chorus to. That sounds perfect. And uh, it's going to be done soon, but uh, it's called Welcome to the Club. So what to you is just a, just a chorus, to us is a very rich experience. So it, it's a full plate. Okay. I've got a lot, I've so many things in progress, it's kind of scary. One thing about the, you know, PD, I don't know if it's, maybe it was me, I was always a creative person anyway. But I've run across many warriors who seem to have taken up things that they never would have thought they'd do. And they do amazing artwork. They do quilts, they do painting. And I have a friend of mine who does, uh, he takes the tree trunks or trees that have been blocked and he carves out incredible um, cities in there, you know, and uh, just incredible creative things that happen. And, uh, so glad you shared that, that, you know, while something may look like it's going downhill, other things can open up and just so. to be open to that possibility and reality. So this idea came to me and, uh, and this came to me as a course. And I imagine, I imagine that, uh, you know, I belong to several, you know, groups of PD kind of warrior groups and uh, we kind of support each other. And I thought to myself one day, welcome to the club. Now you're one of us. You're in like you don't know. You don't need to run. When the day is done, we might be the best chance you got. Welcome to the club. Oh. oh, oh. And the verse goes there. <laughs> So that's Good a start. Yeah, I love that course because it's just, uh, you know, welcome to the club. We're going to get over this together. We're looking forward to meeting again at another time to hear the rest of the song. Uh, okay. Is there some place where people can hear some of your songs, like the one that we you played before? Yeah, at uh, ArlenBennett.com, which is in progress, but there's an, uh, some songs there that you can hear. And I'm on, I'm on all the, uh, you know, the iTunes and the this tunes and Spotify and everything like that. Look for my name and I've got three or four CDs out there. Beautiful. And um, it's, uh, I've got this world of possibility out there and Be the Change, which is another one I've done. And, um, they're all out there. Beautiful, beautiful. Except for, except for most of the club, which will be out there probably in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Arlen, thank you. I'm going to make a few closing comments, but don't go away, anybody, because then we're going to come back and end with some more of your music and David leading us through a wonderful movement experience. Uh, so it's time for a couple of thank yous and I uh, hope you all have eaten your lunch while you're learning. Uh, so first, thanks to every one of you who tuned in and joined us, and you should tell other people about our next meetings, and I'll tell you where you can find out and keep up to date on all of that. Thank you to the team at Parkinson's Wellness Project, led by incredible Susan Lust, uh, and thank you to our three, yeah, let's stop, you're right, and our three generous sponsors, U.S. World Meds, Adamus, and Acadia, for hosting our second Stay at Home, Learn Together While Apart webinar. And thank you to our incredible guests. Another round of applause for each other. And uh, please stay in touch. Watch for future events at parkinsonswellnessproject.org. And after you leave today, after the seminar is over in a few minutes, 
there will be a survey in your web browser that will show up. Please let us have some feedback because all the work that Susan and everybody else are doing is to help all of you. So we need to hear from you what was meaningful, what was not, and where you'd like to go into the future. The next event uh, will be listed on the Parkinson's Wellness Project.org. Uh, we're going to invite, oh, well, let me just see what, I lost the comment here. In any case, the event, we have a date for it, and I'm, I, oh, the date is Tuesday, did I get this right? Tuesday, July 14th? Sue? July 14th, it's not going to be a Sunday, it's going to be a Tuesday. Good, so it is right, Tuesday, July 14th, there'll be a two-part program. Dr. Stu Isaacson will be with us, uh, and he will talk about telemedicine, how to make, you, how to make the best use out of a telemedicine visit with your physician. We will also have a return visit with Alex Tresser, and Alex Tresser and Dr. Isaacson together will join hands in the issue of telemedicine examination and, e and evaluation. Uh, and uh, thank you again for being with us. Uh, we're going to invite David back to lead us in the closing dance with Arlen's song, and we are going to invite all the Parkinson's Wellness team, including Alita Gelb, Shana Markova, Markaro, Susan Lust, Maurice Lust, and Lynn Jurek. Lynn Jurek is a very special person. Are you here, Lynn? Can you hear me? I don't hear anything back, but Lynn is Sue Lust's mother, so she must be very proud seeing all the goodness that Sue is bringing into the world for everybody. Are we queued up here together, David, Arlen? Yeah. I just wanted to uh, to confirm that we're we're doing this live with Arlen playing, or are we doing this with the recording? That's a good question. I'm good with either. I just David, just want to. David, David, we're going to do it with the recording. We're okay. Gonna... Okay. And you're playing the music, right? It's through your. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. I just wanted to double check on that because I see Arlen like it's so <laughs> Arlen. Your music is incredible, <laughs> and it's such a joy to have it um, to have it live. Uh, I think for this, we're we're doing a little snippet just because we're we're right at the at the end mark of our presentation. So I just want to thank Arlen for sharing your artistry with us, sharing your positive message, sharing the the value and benefit of of music and art in our lives. So important and really ties into so much of what our uh, our clinicians clinicians were talking about earlier. My video. Hmm? My video. Only recently, I think that we've you know in the last. 100, 200 years of, um, of Western medicine that we've seen a divergence of art and medicine. For many cultures around the world, art and medicine, are, are, are they work together. And so I hope we can see more of that, uh, particularly in the Parkinson's world, because I think it is so, so relevant. All right. So I'm going to move back a little bit. And I just want to thank Arlen for being comfortable with uh, using a, just an excerpt from this song, um, which is a lovely song. And I hope you all can hear it on Arlen's uh, website right after this call. All right, so just getting comfortable, making sure you have a little bit of space around you. And uh, here we go. Reach inside your mind. Find the dream you thought about for a long, long Climb the mountain that you always said you could The one you always said you would. Reach inside your pocket Find the change you said that you always make Take the chances that you've been afraid to Don't turn back now Don't turn back now Dreams are there for the making Don't turn back now Don't turn back now Stars are there for the taking If you can see through the
See you all soon on the 14th. Take care. That was beautiful. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Terrific. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. That was great. Thanks, everybody. Great to be with you. That was, it was really wonderful. Thank you. Good end it.